with you. To prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, we call to mind the ways that we have failed to love God and our neighbour, and confess in the quietness of our hearts. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. God, wonderful in your light, by glorifying your Son, you opened the limits of our and your world, of heaven and earth, of time and eternity. Make us scale walls with him and live from his spirit. This we ask through him who in the unity of the Holy Spirit lives and works with you now and forever. Amen. First reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, beginning of verse 6. So when the disciples met together, they asked Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has take, been taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Mm -hmm. Then they returned to Jerusalem. From the hill they called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all who <coughs> you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence, with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made, no, my, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, 
and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. These are the words of the Holy Gospel. They are words of eternal life. Praise to you, O Christ. So you might be wondering why we've got this third candle here today. It's what we call the Paschal can candle. Paschal coming from the Hebrew word that means Passover. Traditionally in our type of church, a new one of these Paschal candles, sometimes called the Christ candle, is lit at sunrise on Easter Sunday morning. And it represents the coming into the world through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And in the modern Episcopal Church, we light this candle at every major service right up until Pentecost. Pentecost, of course, is next Sunday. But the original tradition was that it actually only burnt for 40 days, not the 50 days that it takes to get to Pentecost, but for 40 days to Ascension Day. And of course, Ascension Day was on Thursday. In the UK, a lot of churches celebrated Ascension Day on Thursday. In the United States and in other parts of the world, Ascension Day is transferred to today, to the first Sunday after Ascension Day. So in the tradition of the more ancient church, we're going to put out the paschal candle, because that symbolizes what we're going to speak about, what our gospel reading said. It symbolizes that on Ascension Day, Christ went back to the Father. He's no longer bodily or physically present with us here on earth. He's gone to sit at the right hand of God the Father. We have to manage without his physical light, we instead have to be the light, which is why the more ancient church would extinguish the candle at this stage after the gospel reading. Now how many of you have caught up with the story of Mr. Camping? You're looking puzzled. Mr. Camping is an American preacher. He predicted the end of the world. What he said was that all the non-believers were going to be dead by the 21st of May and all believers would be swept up into heaven. It's what the evangelicals call the rapture. The second coming of Christ descending in the same way that he ascended. And Mr. Camping's followers, so it's reported, spent all of their money including their children's college funds. They gave away all their worldly possessions. And the media is reporting them now as being bewildered that the end of the world didn't actually happen. And apparently Mr. Camping feels terrible. But he then says that he only made a simple miscalculation. The end of the world is actually coming on the 21st of October this year. Now, I see the smile on your face, but don't laugh because this man is deadly serious. <coughs> a very real part of what we call the Christian church, the same church to which we belong. And within this church we have people who believe all manner of strange things. And different branches of our church will command that we believe their particular strange interpretation. For example, the rapture has Mr. Camping and many, many other 
denominations believe, or perhaps the Immaculate Conception, uh, or the perpetual virginity of, uh, of Mary, as the Roman Catholic Church would literally command their members to believe. Or perhaps if we go back to the other side, the, the, the extreme evangelicals, again, perhaps the creation story, which is believed within those denominations as being literal fact rather than an allegory of, of, of how God created the, the, the world. And so it goes on. So where were we? The, the, the creation story is a little truth. And I say I'm not picking on individual churches. Um, the, the fact is that they do believe those specific things. Mainline churches don't necessarily believe those. Sometimes Christians appear to be making it up as they go along. But the message that Jesus gave us was a lot simpler. I have revealed to you, sorry, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. So the setting for this gospel reading that David read just a short while ago, it's simple, quite simple. Jesus is about to go away, and leaving this fragile, small group of disciples on their own for the very first time, how are they going to cope without him? What happens when they no longer have his visible presence to support them? Now the immediate reaction of Jesus was to raise his eyes to heaven in prayer. He called upon the Father to be a father to them, to watch over them just as he himself had done while he was still with them. It's not as though they were strangers to God the Father. As Jesus explains, they were actually given to him by the Father. Moreover, he had passed the Father's word on to them. He had made known to them everything that can be known about the Father. And now his prayer was that the Father will keep them in the power of his name by gathering them together and giving them a oneness that will reflect the intimate union between the Father and himself. Jesus prays aloud in the presence of people that were his friends. He knows that his words are going to give them confidence. And more than that, a sharing in his own joy. He's soon going to leave this world, but they are going to remain in it. And life will not always be kind to them. Like Jesus, though, in the world, they will not be of the world. They will not be worldly people, allowing themselves to be run over by worldly standards or ambitions that draw them away from God. Indeed, the likelihood is that they will even be hated, just as Jesus had been. So Jesus begs that they may be consecrated in the truth. He begs that his Holy Father will make them holy that he will enable them to live lives that reflect all that they've learned in it and through Jesus. And finally, just as Jesus was sent by the Father, so they, in turn, were sent by Jesus as his missionaries in the world. Now sometimes this particular gospel message is only applied to priests or ministers of different denominations. They're the ones that we expect to go forth and spread the good news, the news that Jesus alone is the way to God, that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. He's the one upon whom the sins of the world were put and were forgiven by God to all who truly believe and ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. But in reality, no, it doesn't just apply to priests and ministers. 
It applies to each and every one of us as, a, as well. A simple message, meaning that we must each individually as well as together, as well as collectively, take full responsibility for doing what Jesus asked of us. It is all of us that Jesus sends into this world to bear witness to him and to his Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is all of us that we place that lost light of Jesus. We are now the light of Jesus in this world. It's not good enough to simply rely on the words of the Mr. Camplins of this world. Their message is a message of man, not of God. Their message is a way that leads us, or tries to lead us, to try and reach God through deeds or actions, rather than through repentance and faith. The former Bishop of Durham of the Church of England, who's incidentally now a lecturer here in Scotland at St Andrew's University, makes a suggestion for all of us in one of his books. His suggestion is that we put aside a little time to read through this gospel passage again, but slowly and thoughtfully. And this time we read through it, we read our Lord's Prayer as though it were prayed specifically for ourselves. So wherever there's an I, <coughs> we substitute Jesus. And wherever there's a they or them, we replace it by I or me, so that the prayer will run, run like this. Holy Father, keep me, whom you have given back to Jesus, true to your name. Jesus isn't asking you to remove me from the world, but to protect me from the evil one. As you sent Jesus into the world, Jesus has sent me into the world, and so on. Jesus spoke of sharing his joy with his friends. If we read his prayer in the way suggested, we too will experience not only challenge, but perhaps hope and deep down joy. That will be our rupture. Next Sunday, as I've already said, we will celebrate Pentecost. Do you have a service here next Sunday? No. But next Sunday, every other church will be celebrating Pentecost. It's a symbolic remembering of the day when Jesus sent his Holy Spirit into his church to watch over it, to guard it, to inspire it. Allow yourselves to be filled with that Spirit. Allow yourselves to be led by that Spirit. And pay no heed to the mere words of man. Let us pray. Through Jesus, whom we confess as Lord, we give thanks and praise to the Father, calling on him who is judge of all. Father, your kingdom come. We pray for all the peoples of the world, that they may know you as the God of peace. We pray to you, O Lord, Father, your kingdom come. For nations, for leaders and governments, that integrity may mark all their dealings. We pray to you, O Lord, Father, your kingdom come. For all who labour for righteousness, that your presence and help may give them courage. We pray to you, O Lord, Father, your kingdom come. For communities torn by dissension and strife, that your forgiveness may bring them healing. For our own communities, in Falkirk, in Livingston, in King Carden. We pray to you, O Lord, Father, your kingdom come. For the anxious, the lonely, the bereaved, for those who are sick, 
the consolation and peace may be theirs. And especially we remember today Roy Dews and Susie McDermott. Father, your kingdom come. We pray for those who have lived and loved and served and are with us no more. Particularly, we remember at this time, Match, Jim. May rest and light be theirs. Father, your kingdom come. For the church, your household and family, that she may be firm in the confession of her hope, we pray to you, O Lord. Father, your kingdom come. In silence we remember anyone or anything that is on our hearts and minds and offer it to God. Mm-hmm. Merciful Father, accept the prayers that we make for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. sign of peace and reconciliation. sing again and it's a more modern hymn this time Lord Jesus Christ you have come to us you are one with us Mary son and the offering will be taken during the, the singing of this hymn
God our Father, we pray that our gifts be acceptable to you, to the Almighty Father. His glory and the salvation. His glory and the salvation of the world. As I said, we will be interspersing it with four verses. It's clearly marked in the orders of service. It doesn't matter if you don't know the tune, just pray the words. But it's a very simple tune to pick up. So we pray. God our Father, may our prayers come to you and may you accept the gifts which we offer in the joy of this Easter tide. Keep us in joy until everything has been accomplished through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you, God our Father, and magnify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead, he sent the Holy Spirit to his disciples, his life in abundance, his salvation and his peace. Through him you gave us the breath of life of your Spirit, in whom we call you Abba, Father. Therefore we praise you in pastoral joy, and join the praise of heaven and all Christians on earth. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
cup with wine. He thanked you again, saying, Take and drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant, my blood which is shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as a memorial to me.
Let us pray together. God, source of all life, you created us anew through the resurrection of your Son. In your loving kindness, turn towards us and abide with your compassion always with us until we rise to life incorruptible and may gaze at you as you are. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.